and welcome to the Quinn Central Comics Book Club! Yay. I'm Alice Quinn, your host, and with me is... Uh, hi, I'm Allison O'Toole, and I am a website editor, comic editor, writer of things. I wear many hats. Okay, so I just gotta say, Allison, you look so good in all of those hats. Uh, but let's begin. Uh, we usually start off with the graphic novel, and this one was really meaty, pretty long, if you guys read it, so let's jump right in. Uh, we have the sculptor, which is just so cool. Allison, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get you to intro. Uh, okay, sure. Um, it's a book by Scott McCloud, who has written a bunch of really important and amazing books about comic theory. Um, if you haven't already read Understanding Comics, please do that. Uh, so his graphic novel is about a guy called David Smith who wants to be a sculptor and is struggling because he feels like his, his art isn't going anywhere and any of his opportunities to get gallery space and that kind of thing are kind of meaningless. And then death gives him the opportunity to exchange his life for an incredible uh, talent and ability to sculpt any material he comes across. So in exchange for that power, he agrees to live for only another 200 days, and obviously he falls in love, and things get uh, hectic from there. What did you think of the book, Alice? I enjoyed it, um, but I could see why people might not necessarily would. It is a really long for a graphic novel, and I mean, that being said, it only took like three or four hours to read. Uh, but for people used to reading like 15 minute issues, it's it's a commitment, right? Um, I'm a hopeless romantic and I love love stories and like a good old fashioned like underdog struggle. So like I loved this book. Um, I thought one of the things that I really enjoyed about it is how it sort of spoke to the creative side of me, how it spoke to the artist within me. Um, the main character, David, is constantly struggling. Hold on. Yeah. Main character, David, is constantly struggling because he wants to, like, make all this art. He's got all this creative passion within himself. He's got all this drive, but he doesn't know what to do. You know, pinning it down to just a piece or figuring out what to, you know, prioritize is, like, not his strong suit. Um, and I feel like a lot of people can relate to that. So, so this isn't one of the pages from the book, from the beginning of the book. And he talks about how his, his dreams keep growing, but his options keep shrinking. Um, and I really enjoyed this feeling that that book had, this theme of the book, that uh, we're all, you know, constantly striving and struggling to create art in you know how we see it uh and how we always just feel like we're limited by time and money and like like practical feasibility um and so that theme really like connected with me uh how did you feel about that aspect of it Allison? um so i'll preface this by saying i was really curious to read this book um, because I knew that it had been very polarizing for people. Um, looking at responses like reviews but also just from people that I knew who'd read it, people seemed to either really love it really passionately or hate it. Uh, and I didn't hate it but I'll play devil's advocate against you because I didn't love it either. <laughs> um, I found the creative stuff I thought that that's something I would connect with because it is something I can relate to, but I just found it so, um, I don't want to say shallow, but it's the closest I can think. I find like, oh, uh, art, there's people are too concerned with money and it's all bullshit. And I was like, oh, wow, like, thank you for this diatribe every other page, whiny white dude. <laughs> I just found him kind of insufferable for most of the book. And, uh, I feel like McLeod had some degree of awareness of that, so I will cut him slack, because you had these other sort of long-suffering characters who were willing to tell him, like, 
shut up. You make everything about yourself and you're an asshole sometimes. And um, like Meg's roommate, Sam, I very highly identified with because she was just like trying to be the parent to these two babies. <laughs> they were both so incapable of being functional adults. And she was just like, oh my God, you have to like buy groceries. And I'm sorry if you want to have an art job. Um, that was the thing too. So his barriers were 90% self-inflicted. And it frustrated me because I was like, I, you know, on some level, like I'm a creative person. I also want to do the things that I'm passionate about. And I can completely understand that frustration where you're like, you know, I'm a failure and I'm trying so hard and I have all these things that I want to say and that I want to do, but I can't for whatever reason. But I found that so many of his barriers were just like, he won't get a real job. He may, won't break these weird promises and take charity. He won't do X, Y, Z. You know, like so much of it was just him refusing to like compromise and just be a grown up for a bit that like got in the way of his um, pulling himself together and then maybe getting back to art. And I just found that really frustrating uh, that it was just like this guy who has these completely unrealistic goals in life. Um, and never really seeming to learn that, uh, you know, art is, is great and is creative, but it's also work. And I think anyone who makes a living doing art would agree with that. You need to work very, very hard. And so much of this was David just like whining and then using his magic powers and then that doesn't work. And then he's like, oh man, well, too bad. It's like, I was, I found him kind of frustrating sometimes. So. <laughs> That's my understanding. And like while I was reading it, even though like I was clearly anchored in that romantic aspect and sort of the I don't know, just like you know, like you get caught up in the feeling. Uh, I read it in very little sittings, so I just totally was super into it. Um I also felt that his his view was very juvenile and it's one of those things that, like, that's how you think about art, and that's how passionate and driven you are about, like, your projects and your hobbies when you're in high school. When you, when you have all this, like, spare energy and free time, and you can't go to bars, and, like, you don't have enough responsibility to do anything on your own, this is when you get these, like, giant ambitions, and you have all that time and energy to, like, work on stuff and to make it awesome and excellent, like I did with my website. And then you become an adult, and you have things to do, like, get a job so you can pay bills. Then when you get home, you have to like make food and then you have to clean your apartment and shower, laundry, like the whole thing, everything builds up. So you have to literally schedule in time for your creative pursuits. And there's a lot of both, of, both like of the characters just being very naive. Uh, I'm just gonna show you a image. Um, which I really feel illustrates how dramatic David is. This is what he sees in his head. Um, and he's just, he's over the top. And in a way, I, I really dig it. Because it makes the, the superhero, the superpowered aspect, and like the deadline, and the romance, I feel like it makes it all the more like grand, and it builds it up. But I'm also realistic in the sense that, like, if I met these people, I would hate them. Like, I wouldn't hang out with these people because they're not, <laughs> they're not grounded in the real world and they don't understand how to, like, be human beings. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, yeah, so I found that frustrating. I was always just like, oh, that roommate's right. You shouldn't just invite strangers into your apartment. That's not safe. That's not whimsical. That's just irresponsible. And I, I think I was too, I felt like too much of a grown up, like scolding them the whole time. Well, okay, I'm going to show you another image. It's one of these things that it would have been more uplifting. It would have been more romantic. It would have been more epic if he edited it and if it was like way shorter. Because I feel like this type of thing and these flights of fancy really work well in a shorter piece. Um, just because the book is like 400 pages and because there are many, many scenes of him doubting himself, of him having like sort of like an, a creative block where he doesn't know what to do next. It, it does sort of like feel like 
it's repeating itself and it's not as fast paced because yes, time is moving and he's moving closer to his like death deadline, but he's doing a lot of like whining and procrastinating. So I feel like it all would have been better, like a hundred pages shorter. But then again, the pages and the art and everything is just so beautiful um, that it, I don't know how they could have, like, I don't know if it would be the same uh, sort of power uh, that these images hold if it was shorter. Um, yeah, I, I would agree. I, um, the length I didn't really have a problem with because McLeod's art is, is incredible. Like that, I have no complaints about it. It's gorgeous. And the way he lays out a page, like sometimes you'll get only four panels on a page. So it goes pretty quickly despite being like the size that you could kill a man with. Um, so I found as you, as you did that it went pretty quickly despite being very long. And so I, I kind of liked the slow meditative pace and there were periods where I actually kind of enjoyed spending time with the characters where you, when you got glimpses of their world beyond this kind of juvenile immediate relationship, when you could see, um, you know, the extended people that, uh, you know, oh, well, I got with that. that she worked with, then, uh, that kind of stuff, I actually, I liked a lot more because it just felt more um, relatable and real to me when they felt like real people. But um, it, uh, so the art definitely, no complaints and elevated it. Because with that story, if the art had been bad, like I don't think I could have finished it, <laughs> to yeah. be perfectly honest. Um, so I'm going to show you another image of some one of these moments where it feels like they're connected to a greater community. They're having Hanukkah. Mm -hmm at um crap what's her name it's in meg's apartment i think meg meg's apartment <laughs> We're talking about the this fact that you don't name. remember her name is not really a good sign of how well uh he constructed this character now is it <laughs> well i mean it's a classic case of Ma manic pixie dream girl where she is sort of like like I showed that image before of like how they first meet where she comes at to, out to him as an angel. And then, <laughs> hold on, I gotta, I gotta. And then later on when, you know, she finds out he's a virgin, it's just like, oh, to, to, totally juvenile and now like first love and just like super sap, super, super sap. Uh, and yeah, she is, she is sort of like that redemption. She's like, um, it's it's almost in a sense they when they they're sort of f uh, phrasing it in a way that it's it's art or human relationships that seems like to be sort of part of the themes of the book is that like yeah you can immerse yourself in your art and yeah you can spend every day in the studio but then your life passes you by you know you're not seeing people you're not seeing friends and so when uh, the Prop is when the proposal is given to him at the beginning, the guy starts off with, this could be your life. You could meet an amazing girl. You could settle down. You guys could have kids. Uh, you know, you'll always sort of regret not being able to take your art further, but you'll have a, you'll have a fulfilling and long life. And he chooses to not. And then, you know, he meets Meg and he sort of tries to have it both ways, but you can't have it both ways. I feel is sort of what this book is saying. There is, you know, people in real life can find a real work-life balance, but um, not in this book. Yeah, it's like we, we we do spoilers here, right? I can talk yeah. about the ending. Yeah. So I like I hesitate in general to use the manic pixie dream girl term just because I think it's lobbed around a lot at any care women woman character who's like kind of quirky. Um, but I think that that's exactly what this is, and it's some way like, McLeod was trying to subvert that because they'll have her say like I'm not a thing I'm not an object for your art and as I said like have these other characters will kind of yell at David so I feel like there was part of him that wanted to subvert that trope but ultimately he just feeds into it because yeah she's literally an angel at the beginning she 
just seems to give up whatever it is she does during the day to like tag along with David. She's like, yeah, spontaneous and her mental illness is even kind of romanticized because she's like, you know, she wants to feel everything. She doesn't want to take pills because they're like evil and they'll take away from her experiences. And then like, of course she has to frigging die so he can put his art up. And I couldn't even believe that she like there was no narrative reason for her to die because he was gonna do the skyscraper art thing anyway. And that it was her and the baby. And I was like, kill me, please. The idea of that, like, oh, his family would have been his real art, but oh, it's too late now. As you said, it's like, you could have it both ways. You're just too stupid. And then there was no reason for her to need to die for any of that to happen. Like, he didn't need her to die to achieve self-actualization. Yeah, so what you're talking about is this image at the end. Um, while I agree, it totally gave you all the feels, and I definitely teared up, like, more than a tear. And it was also sort of, like, hitting you over the head with this theme, where, as I thought, um, I'm just going to go back to this one. I, just before that scene happens, we get this scene where David finally reveals his masterpiece. Now, personally, I feel like the book should have almost ended here. Or not even almost ended. I feel like this was a really good, like, sort of final hurrah for the book because it's this amazing giant sculpture and it's it's all these, like, interwoven threads. But if, if you look carefully, there's little tableaus inside of it and you have to just turn it a certain way and all these like whole other world inside there is revealed. And I thought that was amazing. And I thought that was mm -hmm. like, yeah, he's got an artistic masterpiece. This is his life's work. This is worth it. This is something amazing. And this is like, this will, will achieve critical acclaim. I didn't feel like it was necessary for him to go out and make that building. I mean, obviously after, you know, she dies, He's got to, but for the sake of the story, I don't, I didn't, like, this was the art masterpiece for me. Yeah, no, I totally agree, and that one, like, as a concept, is like, oh, that's actually really neat, and it's really interesting, and it does the sort of, like, life is art thing, but without sort of hammering you over the head with it, um, and then, of course, where does the book end? With them fucking in bed. Like, the, their sex and their relationship. It's like, this whole thing was supposed to be about art, and now we're here. Um, and I just, like, the whole thing had to be about, like, her as this idealized figure. And I get to some extent, like, to cut him some slack, when you're doing it so hard from your protagonist's perspective, it can be difficult to give that kind of inner life to your character that would have sort of, diff like, brought her away a little bit from the the manic pixie dream girl thing. Um, and I appreciate that that's difficult when you're so wholly in this one character's perspective. So I will cut him slack there, which is again something I think he tried to do and didn't entirely succeed. Um, but yeah, I think ending it there and saying, okay, I have three days left, like what are we gonna do with them? And just kind of leaving it there would have been really nice. Oh, and I also thought it was super gross that he was like framing this fetus as like, part of me is gonna live on, but through her. And I was like, not through your art, like through the weird yeah, baby. I You're gonna agree. get obsessed with that now. I like that was, I found that really Because awesome. at that point he had already finished this amazing masterpiece. And like, that's way better than just progeny, just saying. Um, I need to shout out to the comments because I've totally been ignoring Megan. Megan, I am sorry. Uh, Hi, Megan. So Megan says, yo, hey, how do I get on the show? These ladies be leaving me out. Sorry. Sorry, Megan. We're totally paying attention. Um, <laughs> she's heckling the both of us. This book is giant. It's like, it's it's a pretty good Wait, you read it? Why, why aren't you here, Megan, if you read the book? I thought that was why you weren't here. <laughs> yeah, Megan, you should get in on this video chat right now. In fact, I am sending you the link. And it, and you should just join in. I don't care where you are. I don't care if you're wearing your, like, painter's cutoffs. You should, you should totally get on this. Oh, yeah, she commented on, like, every statement that we made, didn't she? Sorry. God damn it. I'm sorry. I haven't been paying attention. I just got so... Riled up. up. Oh, yeah, this book is great. 
Um, she's got more comments, so I'm just going to screenshot those and we can discuss them. All right, while we wait for her to just come and give them to us in person. In person. Where did I put the video link? I don't, hold on. <laughs> um, did, I don't know, what else is there to discuss about this one? Megan, I'm like, um, sorry, Allison, I'll let you lead the way. I'm trying to think. That was a lot. Of, like the the stuff that mostly stood out to me was like the character work. But honestly, the like the book is really beautiful in terms like it's art wise. So um, if you're a fan of that, then I would definitely recommend checking it out. But uh, yeah, we kind of hit on the big themes like the art thing, art versus relationships, and that kind of thing. It's really. Oh um, hey! Oh hi! <gasps> hey! Oh my gosh! Hey. Sorry, I'm slowly catching up to your comments. I haven't seen any of oh, them yet. Here, let so. me take off this YouTube channel so now I'm not hearing lag. Hello! Oh, hey guys! What's going on? I, I'm surprised that you weren't here earlier. I thought I'm that also surprised been... I wasn't here earlier. <laughs> I didn't know you were joining this week. Or else I, was I, thought, I thought that's why you asked if I was reading the sculptor. Oh, I just thought you would like to tune in on YouTube like you do sometimes. Um, no. Wait, join oh, us. Sorry, yeah, come see my face. <laughs> it's over now. All I read was the sculpture. I didn't read the other one. <laughs> Do it now. Comicsology. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, there you can continue. What was what was your opinion of the sculpture? You, I saw that you said uh, you cried at the end, so you probably liked it. Just read all the comments I left. <laughs> uh, I liked the story. Real talk. Uh, same as Alice. I cried at the end. Like I, I made cried when Meg died. <laughs> yeah, uh, and like you guys were saying, the art is amazing, which I'm not surprised by since Scott McCloud literally wrote the book on <laughs> comics. Mm -hmm. um, the layouts are great, it's really well drafted. Um, I will say, I'm not super loving the cover. Like, it's that kind of lost me. It's creepy, a little bit. Yeah, and like, if it hadn't been for this book club, I probably wouldn't have read it because of this cover. Really? Well, it just speaks to, like, it, it, it like, the cover straight up admits that she's, in some way at least, like, a fiction that he's created, right? Right. Like, uh, no, I think this there is. was a lot of better choices he could have made there. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, besides that, uh, I liked Meg as a character. I do get the Manic Pixie Dream Girl trope. But, like I was saying in the comments, uh, <laughs> we do get to kind of see her be broken and flawed, and she kind of needs saving at some points in her depression bits. Uh, and so I feel like that was, uh, like, pun intended, she felt a lot more tangible uh, hey. because of those moments. See, uh, I can I disagree, though? Yeah. Because I, again, would give McLeod the benefit of the doubt that I think that he was trying to make her more, um, more tangible, more real there. But because she needed saving, I think that that ended up just being very romanticized. So it was uh, this, like, I can be the one who finally, like, I'm not going to let you push me away. I'm not going to leave you in this time. And I'm right. going to make you feel better. And again, like, that whole sense of, like, feeling your pain and not being responsible and taking meds is, like, do we need another narrative about how medication is, like, harmful and we should all just, like, truck through our bad moments? Yeah, and, uh, like, I know you were saying that, like, uh, you know, tends to romanticize uh, the mental illness because she's not taking her meds. Be like, I just want to feel it, you know? I want to feel like shit not getting out of bed today. <laughs> uh, and I do agree, but since we have the roommate... And again, as an aside, we have the roommate saying she should be taking her medication. You know, it would be a lot more helpful if she were doing that. That would make more sense if she did that. Uh, it felt more like Meg was the one romanticizing the depression. Uh, but I do get that idea of what you are saying, and I agree. Yeah, I think the narrative kind of sides with her on it. Like, I, I would agree, yeah. and that's why I think that he did put in those side characters to kind of, like, show that he is aware. But ultimately, they just kind of get overwhelmed and buried and kind of pushed into the fringes, I would say. Yeah. But okay. I agree. Like, I appreciated those moments where it was, like, acknowledgement from the author that they're being stupid children. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, like, author's note, please take your medication. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 
No. Uh, what else? Um, yeah, I I liked it. I did like it, and it got me in the end. Got you in the um, feels. It did. I I I read it all in one sitting. Is yeah. what I did too. Um, this book would not work in issues. Like hundred percent straight no. up, people it wouldn't get like renewed. Um, and that's why some books are better when you just like collect it and then you just put Absolutely, it out there. Because it needs that burn. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna put it. up. I'm gonna put up another image. Um, okay. There's there's somewhat some parts in the book that really got to me, and this was one of them. This was after they had sex for the first time, and they're looking in at themselves in the mirror, and just being like, we're animals, this is like who we are. And I was just like, yes, oh my god, to err is to human. Um, and to human? Yeah, that feels, that feels <laughs> real. <laughs> and I Thanks, Allison. Correcting my grammar, even in speech. Editor oh. for the real. Um, yeah, but like, I, I do, I like Meg, and as someone who is on medication, I could totally get, I totally get where she's coming from, where like, medication, and like, being medicated in that way, that like, really dulls your other senses, and sort of like, instead of having highs and lows, it sort of just gives you an even middle, which right. is fine, most of the times, except when you want to feel like you love your significant other, which is kind of really hard when you're on some medications. Okay. But it's also one of those things that, like, you talk to your doctor, you try new medications, there's tons of stuff out there on the market. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're just, like, not taking your medication just because, that's that's on you, right? There's there's options, and people, there's there's methods and, like, coping mechani mechanisms that if you don't like your medication, you can try a bunch of other types of things and in combination with each other. So I don't condone I think, that, but I sort yeah, of I get that. I think that is a lot of information <clears throat> that Scott McCloud maybe doesn't know. And this book might be illustrating how much he doesn't know about mental illness. Uh, and can I just say, I think Scott McCloud is a jerk based on what? this book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think he's an asshole. I think, oh god, fuck this character, right? <laughs> <laughs> Scott McCloud is very nice. He stopped by my table at TCAF. He is. He is really nice. He gave me yeah. an interview. It's also on this channel. Oh nice. Hello. You guys should go check that out. You know what he said to me at TCAF? What? He said, uh, he said, great book. You know what? I don't have money right now, but I'll definitely be back once I get some money. Oh. Did he? Was he back? No, that's not true. That didn't happen. <laughs> he said he had dollars and then fucked off. <laughs> he shook my hand when I was not at my table, and I was still like... <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Um, yeah, yeah, no, like, I still think he's amazing, despite some problems. Like, I feel like this book was written by someone younger than me, which is the weird thing. Um... For it to have been this, like, project that he was working on for so long, like, maybe it's an idea, something he started when he was a lot younger, in which case I'd be like, ah, that makes sense. <laughs> it <laughs> was. Can it magically sculpt anything. It was. I was actually talking to you yeah, in that interview I about uh, where your ideas come from, and he was saying that, like, the most powerful ideas you have are stuff when you have an ad as an adolescent, and those, like, stories stay with you until you just, like, have to put them out. So... Um, oh, I should mine some of my old fanfics then. Nice. <laughs> some good ones too there. Actually, I just saw Allison. You have not Allison. Alice. What else? This is this isn't fair. This is not. <laughs> I gotta bring other Megan here. <laughs> Back up. Do it. Alice, you have Jerusalem behind you. I do. The book. Nice. I also have it. Love it. Uh, I actually, I, I moved my bookshelf from that side of the room to this side of the room, so you could see more oh, of it, nice. but I'm still tooling with my setup, that's why it's not, like, perfect or whatever, but who cares. Um, I, my you, setup is my bedroom, <laughs> and my, my Protoman poster, so nerd. Oh, yeah, yeah. alright, so, um, any final thoughts or words on the sculptor before I move on to you from Under Mountains? Uh, I liked it, I would recommend it to people. Uh, do you guys also, very quickly, do you remember that Daily Mail article that was going around uh, earlier this year 
from some guy who was like, why aren't comics more like Robert uh, Robert Crumb? And, uh... Have you oh, opened up... I, I, mean, I guess Mad doesn't... Mad still makes magazines. Yeah, uh... Well, he was going on about that shit because he'd walked into, like, a bookstore to the graphic novel section, a.k.a. adult comics, uh, and picked up the sculptor, specifically, and he said the line art was too simple, and it was too smooth, uh... But Robert Crumb was where it's at. And that was my only impression of this book before reading this book. Was that asshole. <laughs> Oh my god, what an asshole. Scott yeah. McCloud literally wrote the book on comics. Part of yeah. it was that cartooning allows you to simplify your subject and making it less detailed, which enables the reader to identify it and place themselves in their position yeah. more. I'm sorry, I don't make comics to specifically make you feel gross about yourself. Did we lose Allison? We did lose Allison. Oh. I'm gonna hope she jumps back in. Okay. Because... Google Hangouts has been a little bit on the fritz tonight. Yeah, I um, uh, also didn't read that, that second book, so you better hope she comes back. Um, yeah, next time, sorry, next time if you uh, if you just message me beforehand, I can get you a copy of the books so you can read them. Ha ha! Allison's hey. back. I'm always oh, jarred by that photo you have on Google Hangouts, Allison, because it looks like a Nana version of you. Uh, she's gone again. She'll she'll come back. Rude. Trying to Rude. Come back. <laughs> it's because you were talking to her. Oh. Okay. I get it. <laughs> um. So in between, let me just tell you about from under mountains. I'm tell me about it, it. The cover looks beautiful. Oh man. So the reason I chose this book is I really dig Marianne Churchland. Uh, she's a Vancouver based artist and it's a whole female her, team isn't it? it I think it is I nice. think it is so this is the cover that Megan referenced Allison are you with us yeah sorry my Google talk plugin crashed I'm back Amazing. that's cool that's cool we're talking about from under mountains so yes. basically um, I know church uh, Marion Churchland and Brandon Graham and some other people are doing this series called Eight House Arclight. And one of the things that bothers me, like, I, I, I checked out one of the issues, but one of the things that uh, bothered me about it is all these, there's a couple of different series and they're interconnected, and that's, like, a little too close to, like, a universe-wide event for me where you have to buy multiple issues mm. a month. Uh, and so that happened a couple months ago. Uh, and I'll check it out when the trade comes out, but I, I can't afford to get, like, three or four different type issues just to read this one series. Um, so, this one's standalone, and it looks really good. Um, and I wish I had all the creators' names, like, on me, but I'm just going to open up my issue. Yeah, you guys, you guys explain the premise to me, because I haven't read it. Okay, so... Here's the thing I do is sometimes I just pick the creative team. Oh, thanks, Allison. Pick it, um, it up. I will pick read. It no, I'll read it. Is it backwards? Can you even read that? It is. It's it's only backwards for you. Okay. Uh, Talking while you long and Claire Gibson and Marion Churchland um, are are the creators of this book. Uh, I do this thing where I just sometimes I'll pick books based on like creators and like the two line previews catalog summary for it, so... We all uh, do. We all do. <laughs> right? Um, Allison, since you and Megan keep cutting out, I'm just gonna do, like, a quick recap with the images. I'm just gonna put them up on the screen, and you guys can all see them. Okay. Alright, so in the first uh, little scene, we get introduced to this character, Esme, and her grandmother old witch crone lady, I don't know. Um, and they're doing this really weird sort of uh, shadow binding spell. And so she takes these, uh, the, the young woman's just watching and the old woman's taking these bones and sort of infusing a spirit within it and binding it to her shadow. Um, and then we've got this other scene, clearly royalty and like a uh, wealthy part of the city. Uh, father being all like, Yo, this candle is closed. This conversation is done. My word is final. 
Fuck your candle. <laughs> Pretty much. And, um, you know, the older son's bitching about how he can do what he wants. Like, it's just annoying how he's got to turn everything into a lesson. And then the woman's just like, I don't know how lucky I have it because women. Am I right? <laughs> your obligation. Right, ladies. Yes. <laughs> right, ladies. Oh, man. <laughs> All right, next, next sequence. We got... We got this sort of roguish peasant character named Tova, as you can see. Uh, and, you know, this person's clearly in debt, a gambler, a rogue, uh, and that's all we pretty much learn. <laughs> and so the, the girl has a chat with her father where she's like, listen, I want to go travel, I want to do things, and the father's like, listen, if your mother was here, she would have had this talk with you. You have a purpose, and it's to get married. What? Right, ladies. <laughs> right, Sit ladies. down, too. Um, so oh, wow, these colors are gorgeous. The colors are mm -hmm. amazing. So this is another sequence where the shadow sort of comes to life, and this page is just amazing, and I love uh, just these panels are just gorgeous. Um, I feel like... Uh, Long and, and Churchland studied at the same place because their styles are really similar. She only did, like, Churchland only did the story, but her art style is really similar to this, so I thought, I think it's pretty good. I'm really excited. And then at the end, the very end, they they sh they pick this guy up out of the gutter and clean him up. You and skipped like, part of the story. Well, I guess you saw him. He gets stabbed in what you just sh showed, right? It's yeah. the brother from before getting stabbed. It's not the brother from before. Yeah, it is. I think it is. So this is why, no. right before, for context, right before we started, Trouble I was confused because I was saying, like, I don't know what's going on, <laughs> but I think it is. It's the same guy because look at his shoulder things. The no, little I feel like... That sounds like great character design. How we how do we differentiate these two? So that's the thing. I actually that was a problem. I I like it. Oh I was God, you're right. It's the <laughs> okay, so yeah, right before there is this page, I just picked the pages I wanted to show. Um, but right before there is this page where the guy's like trying to get back, and he's calling to his horses. No, his horse master. Mm -hmm. to, like open the gate, and then he gets killed. Boom, get fucked. Boom. So I didn't realize it was a separate character, so maybe, I mean, I feel like this is also one of these, like, uh, issues where it's just, like, really broad uh, world-building strokes, and then mm -hmm. we'll get to more in-depth character building later, but I feel like his hair was different than a lot of things. <laughs> uh, well, just judging by, like, the panels that you've shown on screen, like, the colors look really great, the staging looks great with uh, the interiors, but the art looks pretty simple and like like a unrefined is what I'm looking at. Well, I, I get what you mean because even though like a lot of the characters themselves are detailed, the backgrounds are sometimes just like not there. Um, and from like yeah. needing to get an yeah. issue out perspective, I could totally understand that. But it is one of those things For that sure. is a little obvious. Like in yeah, this scene, it's just like. Um, here, I'll bring it up again. This one, there's just, like, yeah. no background. There's just no backgrounds whatsoever. But the characters are interesting, and they're well done. Um, right. Well, this is... I, I would... Uh, in the defense of the artist on this part, like, again, these... Uh, the characters look really simple. Like, even the the dad in the third panel, like, his... He looks very simple, the way his arms are connected to uh, his body... Like, it's just, it's a very unrefined way to draw a character when your faces are so detailed. Um, yeah, I feel like I it's would, one of those the, things that's super noticeable yeah, like in their defense. contrast because the characters yeah. are so detailed and the backgrounds are so simple. Yeah, in that scene specifically, like, I'll give them the benefit. It's like, okay, that's a very emotional talking scene, so you're focusing on the characters. But, uh, yeah, if you're leaving backgrounds out entirely in your interiors and then... If, it, if the storytelling is suffering because of that, then you've got a problem. Yeah, and I and um, we obviously had some trouble sort of differentiating the characters. Um, yeah, if you're... If, yeah, like, I'll, I'll probably pick up the next sorry. issue. Uh, yeah, yeah, if you're having trouble figuring out who it is. Oh, my God, okay. 
if we're having trouble figuring out who got stabbed, then yeah, that is also a problem. Sorry, go on, Alice. Sin. No, no, it's cool. I agree with you. I think that's a problem because I was I was just reading this before we started, and I was on the thing with Alice going like, Alice, wait, what? Who's this guy? Who's that guy? Who are any of these guys? Right. And part of that is the fact that it's um. As, as Alice said, this very broad kind of character like world building thing. So there are all these things that are just thrown at you really quickly, which is fine. Um, but right. there's not that much differentiation between, like, a lot of them have, like, kind of the same complexion and, like, the same kind of hairstyles. Like, all the dudes is kind of long. The girls have it up or in a braid. <laughs> it's just kind of like, mm -hmm. I cannot. Like, have I seen this guy before? Is he new? And I figured out that he was new, but I thought it might be a character from earlier in the story. <laughs> it's just like, I... Yeah. Which and is especially in a book where you're throwing out new characters constantly. Like, you got to have your character designs on lock. Yeah. yeah. I mean, to... Okay, I have to bring this out again. To, to be fair, if you go to the back of the issue, they have these, like, uh, character design sketches, and where they're like, oh, we're going to show how wealthy they are on their clothes. I'm getting to the page. It's happening. Which is interesting, but I shouldn't need to read it to understand. Yeah. And even then, yeah. it's just like And flashes. it was just sort of like, okay, I can un I get that. That sort of makes sense. You have brighter colors and you got more layers for the people that are like nobility and whatnot. Just um, make sure you cross-reference, like, you know, sp uh, important scenes with the index. Yeah, exactly. Tolkien style. <laughs> See, this character, um, Tova, I guess, stands out because she's kind of got, like, a different body shape, her hair is much shorter, her clothes are different. Now that you've pointed that out, I can say she's probably lower class than all of the other characters. But because of that, it's, like, clothes markers, hair markers, like, facial shape and body shape markers and that kind of stuff. So, like, this is character. And the rest of them, like, I also thought that... Sorry that I'm just doing this with a page... But I genuinely thought that um, the character from the beginning who's watching the old woman with the braid, yeah, I thought was the same character as the girl at dinner, like with the, the princess or whoever, I don't know, she's a nobleman's daughter of some kind, the one who was to get married. Yeah. Like, they're not that similar, but it's enough that I thought that she'd just purr hair up. So that's one of them. Right. And the other yeah. one... Um, there's one, like, a clear, that's the thing, too, you never get these, like, close-ups of her, so she's, like, right at the top of the, where is she? There we go. So yeah, I was just like, is. oh, yeah, she just put her hair up different, I was like, oh, no, it's, it's a new character. Yeah, I feel like that's yeah. one of those things that can be easily differentiated by having them have different body types. Like, there's nobody in this book that has, like, an hourglass-shaped figure. Um, they're all sort of like long and willowy and wispy. Except for Tova. Except for Tova, who's like a rogue and wears bulky clothes because she can have lots of shit in it. You know, like, um, and I understand that in a, in a, in a way that, you know, that, that the character designs have to make sense for the character, but I see no no reason why you know like one of them would have an A cup and one of them can have a D cup, and they can still be like like this that. Is even. Yeah, like just like having like, like a couple of those like visual differences that's not hair up, hair down. You know, because that's easy for a character to do. We're like an interesting star. So, Bruce like, Tim syndrome. Yeah. Oh, God, and Jim Chung syndrome. It's so many. Um, like, it happens <laughs> in superhero books all the time. Have you ever read any old oh, yeah. Avengers stuff where, like, you'll, where Captain America, Hawkeye, and um, Hank Pym will be out of costume? The and white blonde guy. These, yeah, you're like, there's three of them. They're multiplying. You yeah. just cannot tell which one. It's hilarious. And so it happens superhero in manga a lot, too. too. Like, they learn how to draw one pretty girl face. They're like, all right, I did it. Repeat that for every pretty girl. Yeah, like, it happens in superhero comics, but then you have such distinct costumes that most of the time they're not just walking around in their street clothes, so it doesn't really matter. 
I mean, it's still lazy art, but if you have, like, three women of identical body shapes standing next to each other, but they're all in costumes, you're still going to be like, okay, that's Spider-Woman, that's Captain Marvel, and that's the Invisible Woman. Like, you're still going to know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and here, where we're being dropped into this completely new world, like, as beautiful as the, um, you know, like, the design uh, in the back is, and how, like, lovely and informative that is, it shouldn't, it was a little confusing. Still, I feel like we're we're just like shitting all over the art when it wasn't a bad book. Like some of it was really lovely. <laughs> the scene with the creepy ghost thing was cool when it stabbed him. I liked that. Um, I, really I don't like, do much uh, high as, fantasy, but I liked it. Sorry. Aside from the characters looking similar and the backgrounds not being super fleshed out, I really like this style of art. Um, for instance, I'm gonna share a page right now, and I really like how. Um, Instantly, you can recognize the looks on their faces. I like how their their emotion is shown and not only told. Um, but at the same token, they have to be recognizable and we have they have to be distinguishable. So even like giving one of them brown hair and one of them black hair, boom, right? That's a distinguishing feature. Um, and it's just one of those things that like I'm sure they went through many character designs and they just sort of got similar closer to production. Um, but aside from the art, let's chat a bit about the story because there is a lot going on here, but like I have a distinct feeling of being like intrigued at the end of this book, which is sort of what you want for a first issue. I sort of understand a little bit about this world and the class system and, you know, because we see people at sort of all walks of life in this book, and there's an uh, uh, an incident in an incident that is going to start the story, which just happened, where like this prince gag just got shanked. So, um, By I'm intrigued by a ghost, and then Tovo was there, just being like, "Oh shit, I'm gonna take this knife," which was a really bad idea, by the way. Allison, yeah. you first. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious, like, I'm definitely interested, and I think it kind of throws a lot at you, um, so it's almost overwhelming, because there are so many threads, and I don't really know exactly what's going on at any time, which definitely makes you curious about the second issue. Um, just in terms of personal taste, uh, I, since I've, like, been older, I'm not all that interested in high fantasy, just in general, um, unless it's sort of mixed with something else. Like, I really like something like Rat Queens, where it's so distinctively our universe, or where it's more, like, urban fantasy or something, but, um, just as, and it's not a knock against the story or anything, but I'm just not, like, a huge high fantasy fan, um, so I tend to feel overwhelmed going into anything where they start throwing around names and places that are unfamiliar, and I'm just like, what? <laughs> uh, I find that any time. Because, you know, like, they can't all be Tolkien, where it's like, here at the beginning, I'm going to explain everything. Here are a shit ton of family trees for you, so you can sort it Here's out. all the mountains and stars. how old they are. Yeah, and that was fine when I was, like, ten, and I was really into that um, <laughs> at the time. But now I just, yeah, I... I so I wouldn't, this isn't a favorite of mine. I don't think it's going to, like, really stick out in my memory. But it's not a knock against the comic, which wasn't bad. Um, it's more just personal taste, not really my jam. But to each their own, you know. I wish them luck, though. <laughs> <laughs> you do yeah, you, I comic. I didn't read it. You. Yeah, okay. All right, done. <laughs> <laughs> Review complete. Yeah. No, but like, as someone who hasn't read it and you're hearing us chat about it, are you intrigued? Are you going to pick it up? Have we spoiled uh, the ending for you and now you don't care? Well, no, that's fine. Uh, well, uh, since I'm, since, you know, I'm, I'm a comic artist, so a lot of the time art is what pulls me in. Uh, but it's kind of the same thing as Allison, where I'm not a big high fantasy person. And that can close me out on a lot of titles where that's a deal breaker. Uh, I also hope this comic does well. I hope this artist keeps on trucking with their character designs. Oh man, you're cutting but that's out. A that was horrifying. Oh, no. <laughs> Did you hear my well thought out? 
review. Yeah, it's so well thought out. Yeah. Did you hear me call the author a jerk? <laughs> <laughs> no, just in tune. No. Uh, we heard that once or twice. Um, no, I, I liked it. I am intrigued. I don't mind high fantasy, but it has to be well done. Um, so I can understand them, you know, throwing a bunch at you in the first issue because they want you to sort of get a sense of the world and the different people in that. So I get that. Um, it is going to be confusing because if they're going to jump between this many characters every issue, it's just going to make for a really disconnected, disjointed sort of mm -hmm. connection. Like, it's not even story. It's the fact, like, us being connected to the characters and, like, giving a shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, we have to see them and, like, watch them be cute or funny or stupid in order to, like, care. So so uh, far, I'm only hooked on Tovo, who stole a knife that stabbed someone. <laughs> <laughs> like, that girl. <laughs> I want to hear more about her story. And that's the thing, is you're not far off from not reading a comic because, because I read the Tovo. comic, and that's pretty interesting. I mean, this other chick who's, like, the crown princess or whatever is interesting yes, too, fish. but like I don't even remember her name, and they don't even talk to her a lot. She's super shafted, and I, don't think, I mean, even though her brother gets killed, I don't think it's gonna change her status or state within the society. It's not like they're all gonna suddenly listen to her. Um, so well, maybe high fantasy trope. She's gonna disguise herself as a boy and run away to the big city. <laughs> I've read high fantasy in my time. <laughs> That's what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Girl has to pretend to be a boy to get respect. Yeah. She's going to become great at jousting or something. Classic. She'll learn to ride a horse, and that'll be her best friend. Yes. We've already got the horse's names. It's true. <laughs> so basically, we're going to write out from Under Mountains fan fiction. Is that what I'm yeah. hearing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We'll make millions. <laughs> it's the um, protest comic. <laughs> no, if I'm doing a protest comic, I'm protesting something much worse than this. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Okay, I'm going to wrap it up by saying yep. um, one of uh, the first comic I read by Marianne Churchland is called Beast. It's not high fantasy. Um, and it's really well done. And it won a couple of awards. I'm not 100% which ones, but... Definitely nominated for a Schuster. Cool. And, and I really enjoyed it, and it's at your local Toronto Public Library, and you guys should all check it out. All right, let's stop searching. Do a little housekeeping. So I wanted to let you guys all know while you're watching this show, uh, I have a in-person live event coming up. Oh, Megan got a tote bag because she commented in the chat a bunch. I wanted to pimp... I wanted to pimp it, and you. Yeah. You know, I, love, I love my book bag. I do. I love my Twitter account. Follow me. Oh. Yay. <laughs> Yay. I don't even have that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Guys, chill. I need to pimp my own stuff right now. Oh, wow. Your turn. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so I, I have a suggestion for next month. Oh, good. Hold it for a second. Okay. Okay. Uh, I do okay. some... I do some in-person live stuff in the Toronto comic book community. Not super much, but fun stuff. So uh, we just announced we're doing uh, our Autumn Ladies' Night, October 24th oh, yeah. at 1 Million Comics. Uh, I sent you guys both invitations. And I, feel I like will not be there, but it's a fun event, and I'm excited for everyone who can go. Rude. I'll be in Kingston. <laughs> it's homecoming. I'm sorry. Boo. Oh I'm my sorry. god, are you going to be the prettiest girl at the prom? What's your dress? What? Homecoming is about getting drunk, my friend. <laughs> and watching <laughs> doing it wrong. wrong. Yeah. Um, I don't know, I just stay at home from every dance ever to, like, watch TV so and read comics, so I don't there, actually there's know no what dance. these are like. There's, I, there's no dance. Okay. It's this just is what I learned watching a lot of teen shows. Just a yeah, lot of teen shows. Yeah, no, I'm going to Homecoming for university, so it is... You go to Kingston, um, sometimes you flip over a car and light it on fire. Uh, that's happened. You get really drunk and you run around on Aberdeen Street. 
Sometimes riot cops come, sometimes they don't. Sometimes you get jaywalking tickets. It's very exciting. <laughs> It'll be that football. Was a, that was a wild ride just to listen to. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Queens is, is insane in some ways. Yeah. I already feel worn out and like I want to go to sleep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, my other thing is, uh, we're going to have another book club next month. ta -da! You can Yay. join in on the Facebook page. I haven't put up the event yet, but I already know what the issue is going to be, so you should all go out and make sure you get it. We're reading Jughead, because Chip Swarovski's writing it, and I want to talk about it, so you're all going to read it. Got it? All can right. you come to book club? Can we tell him that we don't like his book to his face? I just want to see what Ramon Perez. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he's, like, like he's not the kind of guy that's, like, ever going to get too big that he's going to forget his roots or, like, not answer my calls, like some people. But he might just be busy. Um, but I'll, I'll No, I feel like Chip does not have time. We'll just have to give him a glowing review and then send him spark notes or something, like a summary. Well, I really liked the Archie number one, and that wasn't him. But, like, it's it, they're, they're redoing a bunch of Archie stuff, and he's doing the Jughead, and I'm mm -hmm. like... Perfect! Uh, and, like, the Jughead character that's already been established in the new Archie series is really amazing. Um, and he's, he's sort of like this, like, behind-the-scenes fairy godmother, in a sense, where he's sort of, like, without anybody realizing it, he's tinkering, he's, like, setting people up, he's making sure people are, like, on time and, like, whatnot. Like, he's... And... and it's just all behind the scenes, and whenever people see him, he's just, like, eating a cheeseburger, acting like a jokester. So that's what everyone takes him as. So I'm really eager to see what Chip does with it for a solo uh, issue. That does sound really fun. All right, so you guys should come back and tune in. I haven't set a date. Uh, i got a crazy work schedule right now, as in I'm working every day. So I Megan don't... has a suggestion. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have a suggestion for the graphic novel? I do. I do have a suggestion. I think we should read... Here, let me pull it out of my QCX book bag. <laughs> What's in my magic QCX book bag? It's what is it? One oh, Punch wow. Man. One Punch Man. Yeah, by the author One and the artist Yusuke Murata. It's beautiful and it's hilarious. And I think. And it's called One Punch Man. It. Yeah, you should read it. Can you get it at your local library? I no, I got it off Amazon, but you can borrow my copy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Respect. Uh, that, that's right, straight up. Since since Megan does come to the book club a lot, she can recommend stuff, and I will pretty much take it. So I'll check it out if it's in the library and it and it's not it's it's easily accessible. Like if it's still in print, we'll be able to do it. But if it's not in print, if it's not in the library, and if people can't get it, then there's no point. You know what I mean? Okay. Allison, if you also have a suggestion, we could do a backup suggestion. What? Obviously, oh, we should read fight. Frankenstein Mobster. Like, okay, simple. I don't... You guys suck. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and by that, it's I, the best, okay? I love you both and your peculiar, interesting tastes, and I'm really looking forward to reading both Protest books. Book Club. <laughs> okay, we'll all read a different book, and then we'll just argue. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Three <Bad>. hours. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, it'll be our special it. edition Halloween Spooky Fest. Oh, hey, my guy dresses up in costume. It counts. <laughs> Mine's about a Frankenstein mobster. What more do yeah, you Yeah, we got that. Know? Thanks. <laughs> Again, don't explain anything else about that comic. There's the nothing to doesn't. explain. That's what it's about. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> guys, let's let's but let's time to go. Ourselves. Take a breath. Take a breath. Okay. Um. So this is Allison's Twitter. Follow me, yay, Twitter. Yeah. Uh, I'm the Alice Quinn. I'm the Alice Quinn on everything: Twitter, Facebook, Ravelry. If you want to get up to date on my knits. Um. And this is Quintessential Comics, or QCX show, uh, which is also on Twitter and Facebook. Not so much on Ravelry. But um, we're going to have an event post in our Facebook page up sometime this week uh, with 
uh, Megan and Allison's suggestions, and you can vote on what you want to read. Because really, it's up to you guys, the viewers, to decide. <laughs> <laughs> the book bag. Oh yeah, that book bag. Uh, that yeah, book bag, though. I'm, I got a bunch more, like I, I make them, I silk screen them by hand, so I have a bunch more, so I might be doing more giveaways if that's something nice. the viewers are interested in. Allison, I also have stuff for you. I have a book for you, actually. She's got the stuff. Actually, you know what? I'm going to finish the broadcast and I'll chat with you guys more because we can just go on forever and it's already 8.04. Um, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you again next month. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Allison. She's already out. Oh, wow. Rude. <laughs> Jeez. Nope, she's out. Okay, bye. Bye.